thanks so much for coming. It's great to see a good group of hungry minds here, and I think you all made the wise choice by coming tonight because we're all in the retreat. This is a great panel that Marty Dennehy has assembled, successful entrepreneurs. As you uh, should know, you business majors, uh, we are intently pursuing the matter of entrepreneurship because we know that uh, so much of this industry is heading in that direction, and whenever we can bring some success stories to you to share their wisdom and their background, their skills and all of that, uh, it's something that we're glad to do. Uh, I say we, uh, it's, it's really Marty who did all the work on this, and so uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Marty Danahy. have the support that you bring when you come to these events. It's, it's, it's important to us, it means a lot. Well, anyway, don't want to waste a lot of time. I think we have a, a great group tonight. And I'm gonna give you a quick intro, and then we're gonna start to sit down and talk about all things business. So, at the farthest end, we have Joe McGuire, former CEO of Tweeter, Sight and Sound, remember them? Uh, and he has moved on and he has opened up his own business, hence Entrepreneur. Uh, next to him we have uh, Bernard Choi, Chu, I'm sorry. Uh, he is the CEO of First Act Guitars, uh, one of our neighbors right down the street. Very gracious of him to join us this evening. Next to him we have David Avery, who is the founder and president of Powder Finger Promotions and uh, he'll soon tell you what he does. And right here, my side guy, this is Steve Walter. He is um, the owner of The Cutting Room in New York City, and I'm very, very proud to say he's a Berkeley alumni. So would you please welcome them all. And I'll start down with Joe, if you would, just a little bit about your background and how you ended up where you are. Okay, so all the stuff I can talk about only, right? There you go. There you go. Uh, so I actually uh, went to Penn State, went to school for uh, accounting and computer science, came out of school, wrote accounting code for a couple of years, um, got a job as the controller for a consumer, small consumer electronics company in Philadelphia called uh, Bryn Mawr Stereo. And uh, at that time, every, we're back in the mid 80s now, every city had kind of a high-end purveyor of better gear. So in Boston it was Tweeter, and Philadelphia it was Bryn Mawr, and Atlanta was hi fi Buys, and Chicago was the United Audio. And, um, all of those businesses um, formed a buying group in the mid-80s. And then at one point, we decided to put the Philadelphia and the Boston companies together. I moved to New England. We got some venture funding together, and we started to actually roll up that high end uh, of the business. Um, took the company public in 1998. Um, at its peak, uh, Tweeter was uh, 190 stores and about 850 million in revenue, 37, 3,800 employees. Um, today, the company has shrunk some with the challenges of what's happening in consumer electronics today, but still 100 stores, 102 stores, and about 500 million in revenue, about 2,100. Employees. And so that's my story. Uh, the company got in trouble about two years ago. I had been the CFO for about 10 years. Um, the CEO resigned. The board asked me to restructure the company. So we closed about a third of the stores, left a couple parts of the country, and then I uh, washed the real estate through bankruptcy and sold the company to a private equity firm. And that just happened this past uh, July. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bernard Chiu. Um, I, I, was, I grew up in Hong Kong and moved to Boston area in 1983. Um, more as fortunate as you are attending a great college. Actually, I didn't go to college. Yeah. Um, when I moved here, I worked for, for a few years. Um, and have an interesting thought moving from one place to a new country, among other challenges. I thought that I would want to work for a small company so that I can learn everything from 
left, right, up and down. And uh, indeed, I found a small startup company that had uh, three employees. Yeah. And to cut a long story short, in probably six months' time, I became the, uh, uh, the general manager of the business. Yeah. And partly because I were happy smart, but it's really a start coming with no resource. So it's a kind of environment that you can uh, show up a lot more instead of waiting for General Electric. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, in after a few years, I built a business to become probably a 60 million business. And I said, well, it's time to do it for myself. Uh, so I started my own business called Duracraft in 1989. And most of you might not even <coughs> know this. That was the time that was really at the bottom of the economy. There's a huge recession, uh, and people were just um, looking for jobs. Um, but I, and some of my friends said to me, you'd be crazy to leave your job and start your own business at, at this difficult time. And I said, you know, I think I can do it. Um, and the worst the time, the better is for me. So I started my business, and it's got nothing to do with music, first of all, right? Uh, it's a company that uh, we market and manufacture uh, home environmental products. Yeah. And I started in 89, and uh, by the time 1993, I took it public, and then uh, it done very well with a secondary, secondary offering. And in 19, I think in 1997, uh, I sold a business to Honeywell International in an unsolicited offer. Uh, and at that time, and I stayed with them for a year, and, and my division is doing roughly over $300 million business. Yeah. And I retired, and I thought I, I would like to retire early at the age of um, 42, 43. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, I enjoyed it for probably six months. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was looking for things to do, so I started picking uh, up an, uh, a new hobby, playing golf. And I said, well, since I'm going to play golf, I might as well build a couple of golf courses, which I did. And, <laughs> and so I, I, I enjoyed it a little bit, but soon uh, my, one of my associates uh, called me up who used to work for me in my first company, and said, you know, Bernard, my brother and I are working on this um, idea in a basement, and we, we think we can sell instruments uh, to the mass merchants. And we tried that with BJ, um, but we didn't really know how to do it, and so would you come and take a leadership role and, and see how far you can take the business? And I said, oh, no, don't bother me. And then, but they, were, they, but they were consistent. And so every couple of weeks, you know, they would call. And, and, and one evening, I was sitting in my, in my office at home. And, look, and as always, the, the phone call call again. But strange thing happened. And that phone call actually brought, me, brought some of my memory back in the past. What happened was in, uh, when I was in, uh, in Hong Kong, when I was a uh, 16, 17 years old. Actually, I love to learn to play guitar. And it took me two years to save enough money to buy my first guitar. And that memory came back to me, and it really struck me, you know, maybe I shouldn't look at this as a business opportunity. What a wonderful thing would be if I can put more instrument in people's hands. Yeah. And it's with that in mind that uh, we start our business called uh, First Act in they back probably eight or nine years ago. And we had a lot of challenge, but um, we, we're doing well. And a few years ago, we start our artist program. We start make uh, guitars for professionals. And, and, and that part of business seemed to caught fire. We now have a huge uh, and long time uh, bad lot of orders. And artists like Aerosmith, Aros uh, uh, Adam Lavin, who was just literally in our office. Uh, uh, it's Monday, they all play our guitars. Yeah. And, our, uh, and our business is doing well. And we, we're right next door, uh, next block. 
and we have a uh, concept store on the first floor called First Act Guitar, and we have a luthier shop in Somerville. It's a 12,000 square feet uh, facility <coughs> where we hang crafts, uh, guitars for artists, and write people for yourself, and we also do a lot of product development there. Um, so that's really a bit about my background and my company. Thank you. David Avery, president of Powder Finger Promotions, and um, well, I guess I should go all the way back. I was born into a Southern Baptist family in California, <coughs> where we uh, sang a lot of gospel music and hymns and uh, old-time music. Everybody sang, and my grandfather could pick up anything and play it. And that was all really awesome until one day a friend of mine with an older brother decided that he wanted the little camera I had and traded me the White Album and the first Monkeys album that little camera. And things got really weird fast. <laughs> he also threw in a psychedelic lamp. <laughs> um, my parents weren't really that happy about it. Um, one day my mother walked in and uh, the song Why Don't We Do It in the Road was cranked up to about 10. And she decided she was going to set me on the right path by buying me a more wholesome sort of musical approach. And she bought me um, Johnny Cash live at Folsom Prison. <laughs> and uh, so I went from being uh, intrigued about sexual innuendo to being frightened by people cheering about murders. <laughs> <laughs> and really it's kind of come full circle in a way, because uh, we work with that, both of those kinds of music now. But, uh, um, so that's kind of when I started going down the, the, the you know, wrong path. And uh, so I grew up wanting to, I grew up a music head. I was just obsessed. I listened to everything. Um, I got really into rock and roll. And later on, I started discovering jazz. And uh, country was kind of square to me, except for Johnny Cash. And uh, I ended up going to a uh, Mennonite college in Fresno, California, Fresno Pacific College. It wasn't a Mennonite, but they had a really good choir. And uh, underneath the uh, Evangelical Bernier is a very <coughs> left wing theology department, which also put me on a path that wasn't too popular at home. Um, and um, so I came out of there with a composition degree, um, did a lot of choral performance, um, things like the Mikado, musical theater, and um, <coughs> was in a rock band at the same time. And um, got out of that and got a job as a classical music announcer at KDP. In Fresno, which had uh, you know, NPR, classical music, and jazz. <clears throat> and man, was that a cushy job. I mean, you know, you put on like a Bruckner symphony, and you're set for a while as a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's when you can go get your lunch and come back. And <clears throat> you're not even halfway through it. Um, and then I got kind of bored with that and uh, decided to go back to school and um, apply to a few places. And New England Conservatory <clears throat> was one place that accepted me, and I'd never been to Boston, but I knew some people who were here going to school, and they loved it. So I moved here sight unseen and uh, did a master's in musicology over there, which was really, um, <clears throat> I got to say, as a student, was pretty uh, mind blowing. You know, I was one of those people who went there, got, you know, mostly A's and B's, and, and um, I thought it was pretty cool and knew everything. And, my first paper got handed back to me. Every single page was just trashed. And uh, this, you know, I knew this would have been like, you know, a B-plus paper in undergrad. And I was, you know, I had to seriously kick it up a notch. You know, working with uh, Dr. Gregory Smith. And he, when you turned into a paper to him, it was a rough draft. And he would shred it and hand it back to you and expect it to be improved the next day. And so that really put a really strong sense of discipline in me. Working um, academically, and I'd also done a lot of you know, some physical labor. And there was a time when my dad decided to go and buy a ranch. <coughs> I, I can just say that's a good experience to look back on. But, um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of things just kind of added up to uh, me going into music and business. My dad had always been an independent business person, and uh, my whole life. And uh, so I went when I got through with a master's degree. I uh, 
decided to go to the CUNY graduate school and did two years of doctoral study in musicology. And then I, I decided that, that was enough because if, if you have a doctor in musicology, your options are teaching, so that's your main option, and I, I decided I wasn't interested in doing that. So I moved back to Boston and um, <coughs> got a job with Schwann Publications, which was this company started by Bill Schwann in 1950 something, where he put out these catalogs listing every single recording available in America you could buy. And that started getting to be a very huge catalog. So it spun off into like a popular music section, and a jazz catalog, and there's editorial. And um, that was also a really <coughs> pretty easy job. And uh, then something really cool happened. They laid everybody off and moved to New Mexico. And um, at first, I was kind of depressed about it. Then I was psyched. You know, I was getting unemployment, sitting at home, <laughs> playing the guitar, writing songs, playing video games. And then that got really boring. And um, I didn't know what I was going to do. But a friend of mine who was a more serious musician went in and recorded three songs. and said he was going to put out three song seven inch vinyl release. And this was when vinyl, like nobody's actually playing it, it was really hip and certain stations wanted it, blah, blah, blah. So I had nothing to do, so I, I was going to figure out how to get this thing played on college radio. Started coming up with the database and was not at all thinking about going into business as a music promoter. Just helping him out because I had nothing to do and also he let me sing on the record. So I had some more vision too. But <clears throat> that went really well, and I lucked out. There's a local band, you know, this is in 1995. And this is a time when there's a local band called Machinery Hall who didn't even have a CD. They had one song on a digital DAT tape that they sent to WBCN that they were playing like 20 times a week. That doesn't happen anymore. And the result was these guys could play any week in Boston and draw four or 500 people. Okay. And so they had a big name. I just kind of lucked out. They hired me on a whim, went really well, and pretty soon other people were like, hey, what's going on here? You know, maybe we should see what's happening because we got from there to play and blah, blah, blah. And it moved kind of quickly from you know, working into uh, a pantry in my apartment in Davis Square to getting some serious phone calls on people wanting to do promotions. So I had to figure out what to do. You know, how, much, how much money can I make before I have to go off on the point? You know, when is this even out? <laughs> um, and it just kind of happened. I didn't come into it with a big business plan or a grand idea, actually. Um, I came into it you know, with the opportunity to um, try to get some music I liked on the air. And uh, I found out some people would pay me for it, and so I decided I was going to try to get as good at it as I could. And um, now, we were downtown for quite a while, but now we're out of the framing end. And um, it's, it's a really cool situation. We're there with uh, Nimbit and also Specialized Mastering. And so, you know, right now we're in this complex where you can walk in the front door with a finished album. You get mastered and get CDs reproduced, set up on iTunes, do yourself a website, um, email management, you know, radio promotion, publicity, you know, pretty much anything. You know, it's a good place. It's a DIY setup is the way that a lot of artists are working now. And so now we have as many unsigned as signed people coming to us. You know, fewer, there's a lot of bands who come to us who have never thought about a record label. They're not, they're not coming to us saying, hey, you know, it used to be they'd come to us and say, hey, we want to get on the CMJ Top 200 because we want to get a manager's attention and get a couple of A&R guys checking us out and blah, blah, blah. And, and that really doesn't happen anymore. You know, usually it's bands who have it together, you know, have a good release, and are looking to capitalize on what we do. And so we hit uh, about 600 radio stations in the U.S., college radio, community radio, and we also do uh, publicities with national touring, uh, CD reviews, some international press. And um, it's gotten to a point where it's really cool. Um, there's only three paid employees and about four or five, six other interns, depending. And um, you know, the last several years have been especially hip. We've gotten to work with a lot of cool bands, like 311 and Government Mule, a lot of hip jazz recently, uh, Bad Plus, and uh, you know, Bobby Previtt. Oh my God, it's just been awesome. The Desky Martin Wood, and Soul Live, and a lot of sort of fringe stuff. Uh, you know, I've been working with the live Marco Benevento CD, which is, you know, out there um, sometimes, <clears throat> and stuff like that. It really 
kind of pushing the envelope, you know, sending it to jazz stations and being like, you know what, this is good, why don't you play it? It's not really jazz, really, but they're playing it, you know. And it's probably because they need new people, they need new blood, new ears listening to the radio. Um, so we've been covering um, college radio and uh, jazz, new jazz, Americana, um, and singer-songwriter formats, and that's pretty much what we do with publicity as well, and that's uh, where we are today. Thank you. I graduated from Berkeley in 78, the green composition. They didn't have a, a business department yet. I can't believe how large this place has gotten. But anyway, before that, I um, played in rock bands as a teenager, did lighting and stage crew at a concert hall down the Jersey Shore. Got out of college, and like every musician who survived, played in rock bands, taught guitar. So I got bored with that. Disco was happening at times. I'd wear black um, satin pants and play bad girls and all that stuff. I really bored with that. Ends up in the environment center for 15 years. That's a movie's coat manufacturer. <laughs> Got an opportunity to invest in the club, a small investor I invested. I'd walk from my showroom down, and nothing was being done. It was sitting dormant, so I jumped on the scaffold, started painting. Got that finished, nothing was being done. Got more and more involved. I bought out 11 useless partners. Um, <laughs> been here eight years, November. We have amazing music, um, all kinds of icons of play. We do a lot of record label showcases. We have Joan Rivers does stand up every Wednesday, SNL after parties, burlesque every Saturday. Um, it's a restaurant bar, a lunch, <coughs> um, concert, all that stuff. And now we're looking to get a little larger space, expand to other cities like Vegas. And um, it's been unbelievable musically. That's basically it. Well, with the stage set, um, some of the things I, I'd like to hear you folks talk about is, you know, well, David kind of fell into his thing. Let's see. Uh, let's do the easy one first. No medical school. Okay. It would have been a little frightening. Um, so I guess I would say that I've always had a head for numbers. I love to write computer code. Um, and I actually thought I was going to make my fame and fortune, uh, you know, writing some killer application. I actually left school for a year uh, to do that. The software startup was very popular, you know, in the late 70s. Um, Mine didn't work out as well as the best known one uh, did, uh, but it was fun. So I think it could have uh, that could have gone anywhere. I will tell you that um, the success of the last ten years has really not been driven by a particular level of um, uh, education as much as it's been a focus on passion. The thing that was neat about Twitter and the thing that made it successful. And the thing that I think is probably the key tie-in between that company and an institution like this one is that it was chock full of passionate people. Um, Twitter had tons and tons of aspiring musicians who worked at Twitter because you know you get the demo, you know, and you get the, you know you were paid to crank it up, so uh, it was a good thing. Um, but it was really run by people who were passionate, people who cared, and so. Being involved with an organization uh, that was not just about business, but you know, we had a founder who was convinced he could save the world through better audio, um, uh, and that was actually kind of neat. And so, that, and I will tell you that where the company ran into trouble, aside from all the things that were happening in the industry and so forth, is that as the company got to a particular size, that culture, that passion, became really very hard to hold on to, and I think was one of the challenges of the, of the company. So. You know, one of the things I loved about it was being ex able to exercise a leadership role with a group of people who were really passionate uh, about what they were doing. And so it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of hard work, you know, particularly as you're growing a company of, you know, 
for six or seven years, we grew it between 70 and 80 percent a year. Um, and we were always raising money, and so there was lots of stuff going on. So lots of long weeks, but it never really felt like work most of the time. It was a lot of fun because you got to hang out with people who you really appreciated and really liked. And so I will tell you that I don't know that I fully appreciated that for what it was at the time that it was happening. <laughs> it's now, in retrospect, as I look back and I think, geez, what are the things I like? What are the things I didn't like? To your point, would I do it again? I would do the whole Twitter thing again in a heartbeat. It was really, um, it was a lot of fun. And out of that comes some relationships that I think, you know, will endure for a lifetime. I don't know if I covered all your questions, but I'm close enough. <laughs> Well, earlier I said that I didn't go to college. But if you ask me today uh, uh, if I could switch back a car and, and go to college, uh, the answer is yes, definitely I would. Yeah. And, and if I had gone to college, uh, what I would have been doing, I probably don't know. <laughs> but but anyway, um, no, I, I don't recall I have a bad day at work, yeah, and I just love uh, work so much, yeah, and I I enjoy uh, working with people, uh, I enjoy interacting with people and customers, and one of the very unique thing about first ad is we really have um, two different types of people. I mean, two different background people. Uh, we have a few um, business, uh, people with business background. You know, they, uh, they work for a company for a long time. They, they're very business savvy. They know number well. They know how to run a business. And also, I also brought in a large group of musicians, uh, people who, who have uh, professional music training but I don't, I don't really recall if any of them had gone to a bit music business school. Yeah. And they obviously love music. Um, music is their life, it's their passion. Yeah. And, and my job is really um, marry these two type of people together in an in organization. Yeah. And, and I myself, you know, I, I'm a businessman, I'm not a musician, all right? So I, I'm sort of more on, on one side, and then we have a, a whole bunch of people on the other, yeah. Um, and it's really a very interesting situation. Listen, these two type of background of people, actually, they learn from each other. Yeah. They all contribute, but in a very different way. You know. um, take product development, for example. You know, we have a lot of people, they're very, um, musically um, inclined, they know everything about an MP5, about a guitar, acoustic, electric, you know, and I would profess I have no clue about that. Yeah. But what's cool about me is I leave them alone, let them do the work. <laughs> right. But on the other hand, we also have another group of people, uh, they're very business savvy, and they work hand in hand with the musician. So, it's really a winning combination. The two groups work very well together to produce results. Um, and obviously, um, it's, a, uh, it's a great environment. And I think one of the reasons our business is doing so well is really the employees, uh, the associates, the pe people who are who are happy what they're doing. Yeah, and, and I think that's a big part of uh, success. You know, you know, I, I know you can really you know, hold people's hand. You can really tell people, hey, you show up at 9 o'clock and leave at 5. That, that doesn't work. Yeah. And an example was, you know, we, we had one of the um, executives, uh, Craig Small, who happened to graduate from Berlin, and he's one of the, one of the uh, member in, in a rock band, and he had done very well. He had a, had a vision, had a dream, and his dream is he wanted to be a rock star. Um, and as you all know, uh, before you become a rock star, you pay your price. Yeah. And actually, when we started our business, we were looking for uh, 
someone to work in a warehouse. And he actually had a type of a job, and I was shocked that he would even, even consider that. But at the end, we, uh, uh, we hired him, and we said to him, if he did a good job, we want to move him up in, uh, in organization. And I think, in, and he's a hard worker, and in no time we moved him from the warehouse where he hands dirty every day to work in the product development. Um, and now that he actually is the head of our, uh, of our guitar department, which is a very uh, significant um, position. Um, and throughout all this year, he always has a dream. He, one day he wants to become a rock star. Yeah. Um, two or three years ago, he came to see me. Said, Bernard, I got something I really have to talk to you about, and I just don't know how to start, and I know it's not right, but I really want to do that. I said, tell me, what do you want to do? I said, well, um, our band is uh, trying to organize a tour in Europe, and, and I think I'm going to be, and I'd love to go, but it's going to be two or three uh, months, uh, a trip of two or three months. And he was, he, he, he was so um, apologetic, and I said, this is nothing, you need to apologize. I said, follow your heart. Yeah, and and that was a great trip for him. Um, to me, no, I, no, I feel great about that. He's great. One, he's, he's a great executive. Two, uh, the fact that he he was able to do what he liked, I think, is uh, is very important. Yeah, you no, know? and the reason that I'm I'm in my business, I'm with my company, I'm here, is because I like what I do and I follow my heart. <laughs> um, you know, early this year, I was playing out with a uh, uh, with uh, with a skilled dean from the Harvard uh, um, uh, School of Government, and he and the gentleman was very uh, business savvy. As a matter of fact, he he was in a consulting firm and gave up his uh, career to uh, uh, to to become an academia. And we got talking, and and he asked me a question about about what is my attitude about about business. What do I think about business in general? You know, and, and I said to him, uh, anyone in the business world uh, are so lucky and fortunate. Yeah. And for very, very simple reason. Uh, it's really something that not only you, know, you can do what you think you want to do, what you like to do, and business, at least to me, is like a laboratory where you try out new ideas. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't, and your idea is really not important what you start with. Right. Yeah. No, the best idea is really your commitment and your persistence. It's not about what you think we're going to do tomorrow or today. It's never gonna be. It's never gonna be right. You know, I have never seen one person who had the right idea the first time. But if if I'm persistent, if I'm committed to that, uh, I'll get some get good thing out of bad idea, and you keep on fine tuning your idea, and eventually it's gonna work. Yeah, and that's the way I look at business. Business is really a huge laboratory. You, know, you try out your idea, and if you, if you prove you're right, then you reward very handsomely. <laughs> And, and that's really how I feel about it. Yeah, it helps have a good idea, that's for sure. You, know, you want to have something that people either want or don't know yet that they want. And that means you're going to have to educate them, which makes it a little harder. But, um, I was going to answer your worst day, best day question. Go for it. Uh, my worst day. See, the problem with starting um, the way I did, where it just kind of fell on my lap and things sort of steamrolled pretty quickly, is that um, I, I didn't have a business plan, as I mentioned before. And so I was trying to do this uh, the best I knew how, just from experience with my dad. And the first person I hired, I had worked a couple years previously in sort of a similar position, where I was paid <clears throat> incorrectly as a 1099 employee, which means they don't take out any uh, taxes or social security or any of that stuff. And so the first person I hired, um, I had been paying her for a year. 
um, before it was brought to my attention that I could be in like some serious trouble. Because if there's any tax, I found out that the feds care about it, it's the payroll tax. And um, this is where Marty comes into the picture. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so he really guided me through that. It was, it was very scary, I gotta say. Um, but I got through it and I had to eat some money because of that. But and that was the that was the downside, but you know, in the meantime, my business was flourishing. So I learned the hard way, but it was happening. It wasn't flopping, it was growing. And we were getting really cool records to promote. Um, and the other thing I want to say about that is that sometimes you are having a good day and don't know it. Um, and that's, I say that because um, a lot of times what's considered a success in your business is really highly determined by the expectations of your clients. And they might be different than your own. And as, as an example, there's one band we we're promoting. So like the CMJ, their main college chart has like 200 spots on it. And we were like trying, you know, internally really hard to get this thing like the top half of that chart. We wanted like number 100, whatever. And it came in, you know, under that, like 125 or something like that. And we were just like, oh man, we stink. God, I can't believe I'm going to have to call them and tell them. And I call the band, I'm like, look, um, you guys are number 125 this week. And like, a party breaks out. Wow! Yeah. Whoa, we're the best band ever. You know, you guys rock. We're telling our friends about you. Awesome. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, and that, that was like kind of a big lesson for me, really. Because now, whenever we have you know, what I call a career artist coming to us where, you know, say someone like Marco Benvento, where he, you know, he hires us to do publicity for a CD release party or something like that. It, it matters if people are there um, because he's making a living off this. You know, he's, some people come to us and, you know, they'll have a good record, and, but the main thing is they just want it to be heard. You know, they know that they're probably not going to make a living as a musician, but they have something that's good and they just want to get it out there. And they're happy with that, but um, you know, and so their expectations are, you know, in some ways different, you know. But with a working artist, they're really, um, for the most part, less concerned about things like charting than we tend to be. It's like, you know, can you get us on the air in Cleveland because we have a show there next week and we really need to get an interview on the radio? And if you make that happen, then you're golden. You know? So with expectations. Uh, from the with people you're work from the people you're working with, um, what they expect from you, it's uh, you know I learned that that's that's something to, to discuss ahead of time and as you're going and keep talking to the client, you know, let them know what's happening and what it means, and they'll pick your brain. Or yes, they will. <laughs> Some a lot. Steve, uh, you do have a, a little bit different yeah. business than. Involved with. I mean, you're dealing with the public yeah. seven days a week, at yeah. night, so possibly under the influence of controlled substances. Yeah. You know, let's <laughs> talk about the good days and the bad days. The good days are when spontaneous, um, spontaneous things like musicians show up unannounced. John Mayer comes to our Monday Night Jam and playing. We did on that show a Crow concert with Kid Rock and Gwyneth Paltrow. Sting and Sam Moore doing Soul Man, Sting doing Kill the Cold on Lou. Um, Carly Simon shot up playing with her son Ben Taylor and Sally. I don't understand. Is this the bad day? These are the good days. Oh. <laughs> Jimmy Webb doing the show and talking about how he wrote MacArthur's part, but Judy Collins is there who's going to sing the next time. Those kind of SNL party, Dan Aykroyd, Jimmy Fallon at the stage and play. Those are the good things. When you get to sit down and talk to your childhood icons like Les Paul at his birthday and talking to him, you see Pete Best, the Beatles talking to um, Lee J. Kim about the early Liverpool days, which is those are the good parts. The stressful parts are art versus commerce when there's a musician who's really good and you know you're not gonna make money on but he's so good and he's a legend and you book him and you know you're not gonna come out. It's always a hard choice to make. It's good for the room and then bands that suck but bring a lot of people and you're gonna make money on it. It's always that hard call. <laughs> a band's running late but they have the room packed and the next band's getting really pissed because they want to go on. If they don't have people so you're not gonna cut the first band off. That happens all the time. It's really stressful and when you have to cancel night because a corporate party just came in for a lot of money and that's what keeps the doors open. You have to cancel a band and they said they've been promoting. So those are always the hard times. 
And also, as you get higher profile, we have a lot of celebrities that have a celebrity partner. The mayor's task force likes to come in and bust your chops. So there's a lot of city agencies that make their money on giving out tickets. They love to do that, and they'll just make up things, and it's stressful, and you have to go to court even though you win. It still costs money, and it's got to be up early in the morning. And that, they love to do that stuff. We got you know, lumped in with clubs, and they hate clubs, and so you never know they're going to show up. And every time it's crowded, it's, you're scared. There they go. It's going to show up that I know. So that's very stressful. And in, like in that, we have all kinds of like you know, Chelsea Clinton, the Bush twins, Donna Karen. There'll be a booth with Sean Penn and uh, Al Pacino. Those are, you know, high boys, because I never thought I'd get to meet those kind of people. Just so those are the highs and the lows are, you know. Were the Bush twins under 21 at the time? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and things you don't plan for, like a smoking ban, never my wildest dreams would I imagine that you're putting the last smoking. So now it's a whole social scene outside where people aren't drinking, they're outside smoking. The transit strike, um, Christmas week. Um, the blackout on a weekend, that money's gone for good. Nobody gives you a break on rent. 9-11 um, for sure. You know, all those things you can't plan. The economy just tanking. My rent tripling in 10 years. Those are all the triple. things. So triple, triple. 10,000 to 30,000 in 10 years. They, so it's, you know, I can't triple the prices. I can only jam so many people and I can only open so many hours. So those are the really stressful things you have by creative ways to get out of. What's your capacity? The whole place, 350, 400. Our music room, 150, 250, depending how I do things. That's why we're looking for a little bigger space. Wow. Yeah. wow. So, um, and yet, and they, you have six to seven days, the hours are unbelievable. So, um, you know, the, the New York overhead is so high, you have to find all kinds of creative ways to make money. Filming during the day, reality shows, um, anything possible. Wow. Okay, it goes on. Wow. A lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, you know, in one of the classes over the last <laughs> well, week or 10 days or so, you know, the students asked a lot of some questions to me um, to ask a few folks. And um, one, interest, one question I thought was rather interesting um, what was this. In, in the world of business, when it's your business, your baby, you know, when those birthdays come around and those anniversaries come around uh, and the family tragedies, which way do you get pulled? Which way do you get tugged? Have you missed those birthdays? Have you missed the first day of kindergarten? Those, those kinds of things. I thought it was an interesting question. I'm just curious. I miss a lot. <laughs> but business comes first. I have 27 employees, and that's the responsibility. So I miss a lot of good times. I have to be there. I just can't. And getting home at 6 or 7 in the morning, so it's hard to do something like that. So, well, yeah. What do you do, do to unwind? Uh, I, I don't. It's really hard, yeah, it's really hard. Did you take a vacation? Okay, no, it's been years, 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 some I want to get to. But um, <laughs> occasionally movies, so I don't fall asleep. Occasionally movies, dinner, but it's really difficult. This is, I was in the garment center, and, and that's not easy, and this is much harder. So the hours are unbelievable. What is your average day, time-wise? I'll wake up, and my first cup of coffee, I'm ordering beer and liquor, calling me a pair of people, calling people back, because the average person works still, you know, five or six. Work, get dressed, work my dad, stop the bank for change, Post office, I checked all that, and four, between four and six, getting in, the staff is coming in, and, li and you start till four, then you, you clean up, do the money, you're starving in a diner and getting home, you go to bed at six or seven, so you don't know, wow. at least six days. Wow. I mean, there's cash involved, there's a personal thing, musicians come in, they know you, they get to know you, if you're not there, it's just not the same. Right, right, right. I want to try and get more carpet so I can pull myself away. That's yeah. my next goal to do, but to be established, I have to do David, this is this a family versus work question? Yeah, I think okay. it is. You know, have you got a balance or, you know? You My balance is that I don't sleep. Um, I usually get up, because I have two kids, they're seven and 10, and um, one of them, his bus comes at 7.40 in the morning, and the other's at uh, 8.20, and uh, fortunately I also have a wife, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, so my day will start getting up about the time that you go to bed. And uh, at my desk by nine, making sure I know what the heck's going on with my artists and my records. And uh, also Monday, Tuesday are the days when all the um, trade magazines like CMJ and Billboard and FMTV, and they all take uh, reports from radio stations. And uh, it's not a coincidence that that's when a lot of people also have office hours. So they're sitting there trying to figure out, you know, 
what they're going to report to these trade stations is people like <coughs> these trade publications is people like me are calling them and uh, trying to convince them that it should be one of my CDs. Um, <coughs> and so that goes on. I'm usually at my desk somewhere, just depending on you know if there's a Cub Scout meeting or whatever later on till you know six or seven. And often I'll from there I'll have to go straight to club and we'll get done somewhere around midnight at home by one and up again by six or seven. So there's a lot of days like that. You know, it's really kind of a nine to midnight day in a way, you know, but I'm not gonna complain. I mean the latter part of night it's at a club and I'm having a couple of beers listening to some music, so I'm not digging a ditch, but still, you know, that, that it adds up. A lot of hours. It's a big commitment. You gotta, you gotta have a passion for what you're doing. You know, you, you better really want to do it. That's all I can say. It's, it's a lot of hard work. You no know, matter how you slice it, you know, a lot of work, um, a lot to be done, a lot of music to get out there. For that, have you missed out on those birthdays and those special days around the house? And quite a few. And. My wife has said to me many times that every time the kid is sick, you're always somewhere else. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. And I think it's only fair to say that I had two um, very unique situations. Right now, I work full time. And at first, I, and I also have, I also running a couple other side business. And on top of that, I also squeeze in a couple of rounds of golf a week. Yeah. And, and I tell you, I, I manage my time very well. And I think a big part of that is because I, I realize uh, what's important uh, for a business. Yeah. And, and I really learned that from experience. Um, my, my experience, my first business is a bit different than a table later. Um, I, you know, I said to myself when I start this business, I say, you know, I'm not going to be running around, and my goal is only just understand the business, uh, build strategies, and then I want to work more as a coach. I don't want to be running around like a chicken with a head like I used to be anymore. So, so my focus is really on building a team, a team that has very um, deep uh, knowledge of running a business, and and I and I read more about coach, and the, and each of them had uh, has very specific uh, and dedicated responsibility in their area, and my job is to really make sure that they all understand that that the big picture, what we want to accomplish, what a mission is for a business, and. And, and each of them, for example, like Jeff Walker, who is, who is our head, the vice president of marketing, he's really in charge of marketing. Um, and he doesn't come to me every 30 minutes, believe me. Sometimes I don't talk to him for days. Yeah. And, and we have a lot of people like in, in, in the business who, who can run the business very independently. And that's why I, I'm able to do a lot of other things. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, you know, our customers all over the country, all over the world, and we, we sell products to over 20,000 stores, both in the United States, in Canada, and Europe, and internationally. And, and, and I, don't, I don't really make a lot of trips. I probably will travel at most a couple times a year, because there are other people in the company who who do that? You know, where people overseas in China, in, U in Europe, somewhere, where people are always travel every day. <coughs> but, but I think the the beauty about my business is we we have a lot of people, and they and they really take good care of the business. And you know, and it's something easier to set and done. I think one of the problem that a lot of people. One of the mistakes a lot of people make, including myself in the past, was 
No, we always try to micromanage everything. And we try to be too hand on. And, and the problem of doing that is you're not really letting your executive make their own decision. And end up you make every decision for them. And if you do that, then your people, they're not, they become incapable of making decisions because they're uncomfortable without talking to you first. And, and if you have 100 or 50, 120 people in a company, and if every one of them needs to talk to you, you're going to be very busy. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm very fortunate in that respect right now. But I'll tell you, my, uh, with my uh, past experience as a, as a um, executive vice president of my f first company, and also my own company, Duracar, as the CEO and president and chairman, uh, that was a little bit different. And I guess I would contribute to the fact that at that time I was less experienced. And I got too excited, and I wanted to have a hand on everything. Yeah. And, and I think I can do it better than anybody else. And, but you know, the truth matter is that's not important. Yeah. What I learned throughout my career is let other people do the work. Uh, and, <laughs> and if the result is half right, and that's good enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because when you, ha when you uh, have a, a lot of companies that you delegate responsibility to, now you, I can't expect everyone uh, to do it the same way I would do it. Uh, and I'm not sure if my way is any better, to be honest with you. So I think you have to entrust the people. Uh, let them make the decision. Yeah and let them do the work, and then you look at the result. If it's okay, it's great. And that's real, my, uh, my philosophy. What's your golf score? Um, <laughs> you know, I, my, I'm, I, I'm a pretty, uh, pretty high handicap. I'm a, I'm a uh, between 15 and, uh, and 16, and that's uh, this month I'm a 15.8. And, and I'll tell you, I, I would love to, uh, to uh, to play more golf if I can, um, <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm striking my balance, and, and I, I, play, no, I play more golf uh, in, in winter time when I'm making trips uh, somewhere else that I can focus on, but when I'm here, um, I, my mind is really still with the business, to be honest with you. So I haven't missed out on much, but I will tell you that the reason for that is incredibly rigorous time management. And as I'm listening to people talk, I will also say that um, during the life of an organization, how you manage your time and what you do changes pretty dramatically. So when I first, uh, you know, was the CFO of a small consumer electronics company, I was actually personally reconciling bank statements because it was one and a half people in the department. Um, uh, two years ago, when I took over as CEO of Twitter, there was you know 3,800 employees and probably about 100 executives who really ran the company. And um, I'll echo the point here that at that point, you're not focused on, you know, as the organization gets big, you really do have to let go because you can't do it all. You really learn that your skill set has to be about building team, um, enabling people, uh, making sure they're coached properly because you have to get things done through others. You can't, you, you can't do it anymore through the sheer dint of your own will. And that's actually a hard transition for lots of people to make. And I will tell you that in 1998, we got Twitter public and a lot of it, I would look back on that and say, for those six months, I did miss a lot because it was the sheer dint of my own will doing the things that needed to happen in order to get that accomplished. Um, three years later, as we were doing offerings, the company was four times the size. It was a completely different exercise. It was really about managing disparate teams of people. So in terms of how to manage your own life, I guess what I would say is, there's clearly, I don't know a successful person who hasn't figured out how to manage um, the drain that comes on their life, because it does. So, for example, uh, and I think lots of, I've heard this echo from lots of people here, you learn to do with less sleep. So the way I did this when my kids were young was I would be at my desk at five in the morning. And sometimes I would come home, then if I had an obligation to do, and then go back to work. The key 
for my family really became the schedule. My children knew that if their event wasn't on the schedule, I wasn't coming. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just the way it works because I traveled, I flew last year 175,000 miles. I think it was going 160 days of the year. So I traveled constantly, but we had a large national organization, and um, that's what the job requires. So, but you're in control of the schedule. So the trick to all that really became planning. And so I needed to know as soon as I could. And my wife knew I had really lost my mind one day when I was really giving my kid's school principal a hard time because he hadn't published next year's calendar yet. <laughs> and I was unable to plan. And I, you know, my planning was out ahead of theirs. And I felt a little pressure on the arm as, uh, as, uh, as <laughs> we put. So that might have been a little, uh, a little extreme. But um, you know, when you're running any kind of an organization that is growing and successful, and you'll hear this again and again, you've got to figure out how to carve out 70 or 80 hours out of your week. Now, some weeks it might be 60, some weeks it might be 80, and you'll have to balance that among all of your other um, obligations. But it's doable. It just requires um, a tremendous amount of discipline in terms of time management. And if I can make one other comment that came, I uh, wish it had come earlier in life, came later in life, is that the other thing that's very important to do is the choices of what it is you're going to work on. And the person you have to be the most disciplined about with that is yourself. Because the first person you'll lie to is yourself about what's important. And this is really key if you're running a business because we all have things that we prefer to work on over other things. Some things are unpleasant to us, some things we find fun, but in your universe of what you need to do, you need to get all of them done. So being rigorous and disciplined, if you've got 80 requests and you know that you're going to be able to do 20 of them, picking the right 20, and those 20 may not be the 20 things you like, but they're the 20 things that your business or your organization really needs you to work on, um, that is as critical as time management as <coughs> the actual mechanics of schedules. Very true, very true. So you've, you've managed to, to work it out. I think it's doable, but it is a constant high wire act. Still? Uh, no. <coughs> the last 30 days have been pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Another question that came up in class, um, and we'll start with Joe again. Uh, the students wanted to hear about the bots, you know, this is assuming they reach that, that entrepreneurial level and, and do have their own businesses, and like you folks have had to grow a business, what are the kinds of things that you look for in your employees? Um, I've heard the word passion. Um, what kind of behaviors seem to be important to you? Um, obviously, we, we recognize the need for technical skills. But I'm kind of curious, you know, if somebody came in and said, gee, I'm, I'd like to be your next vice president, Joe, mm -hmm. what are the kinds of things that, you know, you absolutely have to see in this person? So that's a, it's a great question, and it's the, as a business owner, it's the most important thing you'll do, is to hire people. And um, it's one of the hardest things to do, and you'll know it if you sit with somebody. Some of this is about if you go on interviews yourself, I encourage you to go on lots of interviews, because just by the nature of doing that, you will learn that there are people who are very good interviewers, and there are people who are terrible interviewers. And then every once in a while, you'll come across somebody who is a master interviewer and who will just peel you like an onion. <laughs> and there will be your soul laying on the table for them to examine. And that's really what you want. And that's a very hard thing to do. So I will tell you that particularly as the organization got larger and you're interviewing for ever more senior jobs, by the time I would interview somebody, the skill thing wasn't an issue. Somebody else had already filtered out that you had either the right skills or the right credentials. And so my job really was to peer into somebody's soul and what's the fit. And I will tell you that um, the single most important thing to try to get from people is that they're passionate about what you want them to do. And integrity is critical. There is nothing worse that you can do for your organization. I haven't done this much, but every once in a while somebody sneaks in. And the worst possible person is somebody who will kiss up and kick down. And they're not a parent right away. 
but they're poisonous and they are destructive. And so if you get to a place that you're hiring, it, it's those sorts of behaviors that are the critical things to talk about. And the questions you're asking to get to those kinds of things have nothing to do with technical competence. It has everything to do to try to get the person to talk about their value set, to talk about what turns them on, what's important to you, what makes you cry, what makes you laugh. I mean, there's a laundry list of, you know, you know, we won't go into all the interview questions, but to really try to get somebody to talk about who they are. And you have to sit back critically and say, is this a fit? for the organization? Is this going to work inside of my business? And we've also heard here, you can't just have the same one kind of person. If everybody in your organization is uniform, oof, that's not going to work. <laughs> you really do need a level of diversity in terms of outlooks and points of view, but you really can't have diversity in terms of core values as they're going to sit inside of your business. People have to really match up that way. And that's a it's a tricky thing, and I think that there's no book you can read that will help you to do that, and it comes really from experience. And I will tell you that the, the best way, I think, for um, a younger person to start to get a feel for that is to go on lots of interviews. And as you're, you know, you're being interviewed, think about how good a job is the interviewer doing with me. Right at the end of the interview, did they know you? Did they not know you? Did they challenge you? Did they get you to open up about something maybe you weren't quite prepared to open up to a stranger to, right? An interview is kind of an odd interaction between, uh, between people. So uh, it is a, it's a very important thing and one that you should never give short shrift to. If you're feeling rushed or harried or you've only got 20 minutes, reschedule it because um, it's a really important dialogue between you and somebody who's going to come work for you and it's critical at all things. You know, in a small company, every employee matters. And in a really large company, put a wrong leader in charge of a group or a division, and you've just ruined the lives of 100 people, right? Not just the one person. You can really negatively impact a lot of folks in your organization by putting the wrong leader in place. So whether it's a little business, whether it's a big business, the hiring one is the one that always would give me the most pause because you know, there are some businesses or some decisions, um, as we've heard, that you can move quickly through because if you get it half right, it's okay. The people decision really isn't one. You know, if you make a mistake with that, then it's, it's, it's expensive in one fashion or another. Do, do you, when, when you do interview someone, do you have a specific block of time set aside for someone? Or you, Absolutely. Or you just, do you think and it's always long. I mean, like, I interviewed, uh, the last senior position I hired was the CFO. The first Saturday, we sat in my office for four and a half hours. Really? Um, the, <laughs> the second Saturday, we sat there for two hours, and then I think I had them come back a third time. I mean, we really, really spent a lot of time together. So, because the amount of time you're going to invest relative to the importance of the position, you know, if I put the wrong person in that job, it's, you know, it has a mammoth impact oh, to the company. Was, so, yeah. so yeah, so it, you, you have to take the time. You know, now I wouldn't spend four and a half hours if I was hiring a stock selector in the warehouse. Right. But at the same time, I still don't want to put somebody in who doesn't have values, whose integrity doesn't match the company, who's, you know, who wasn't going to be. You know, all that stuff is still important. My own curiosity this is not a stupid real question. Yeah. Have you ever hired the wrong person for a job? I have. I have. How bad was it? Bad. <laughs> it was bad. Really bad. Um, I mean, I've done them a couple, you know, you try to avoid it. I've done it a couple of times um, and convinced at the time that made a good choice. But what happens is, is there are people who are good at hiding their true nature, but eventually, right, the facade will crumble. And, you know, the trick is, is what I always want to do is I always wanted to take an interviewer and make them work for two days straight. Because four o'clock in the morning on fast food when you haven't had enough sleep, people's true character really comes out. And, uh, if I could figure out how to put people in that kind of a very pressure situation, um, uh, it would have been great, but I haven't figured out how to do that in an interview yet. Oh, yes. And, and Bernard, what are the kinds of things that you look for when you're hiring employees? Well, first of all, let me say that um, hu human resource is probably by far the, the most significant asset of any good business. 
Um, it doesn't really matter what business you're in. You really need to the, the right people, the good people to to run the business. And it doesn't matter how good a business is. If you don't have good people, the right people, the business will go down the toilet. Yeah. But if you had the right people, no, no matter how bad things are, uh, you can count it's going to turn around. Yeah. And in my organization, I put a lot of emphasis in, in bringing the right people for the right job. And I would hate to say that I look for specific type of people, but that's, that's not what we look for. But we define a job, and then we look for people who we think are the right people for the right job. And different jobs require different type of skill, different fundamentals, and different personality. And an example is, you, know, you, you don't really want an accountant to act like a, a salesperson or vice versa. But the tip two different skills, two different situations. Um, and people obviously is very important. But you know, I, I don't think it's really fair to put everything on the shoulder of employee. Um, and getting the right people, the right job, is is getting half the mission accomplished. I mean the other half is really starting from the leadership how the leadership set a right theme for the, for the organization so that people have some model, have something to follow. But if you don't manage people, good people could be out there goofing too. But if you put certain um, guide, guide, guidelines and, and you have the right ambience, even people who wasn't the best, a lot of time they turn out very good. And that's the kind of thing we, we like to emphasize on is, you know, we don't like to hire and fire people. Although, once in a little while, uh, you have to do it. But, but it's not, I don't believe it's the way to run a business. You know, I believe it is take the right people and give them room to grow, uh, give them opportunity to learn, uh, and give them opportunity to make mistakes. Making mistakes is great, as long as they can learn from that. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think um, putting the right team together is very important because no matter how capable someone is, there has to be a team player. They want to play game together. Yeah. Um, and, and I think one of the things that I think in our organization we were done fairly well is really putting the right team together. And we spend a lot of time, for example, we. Um, Mm, for the last few years, like, every year we will hire probably 10, 12 interns uh, from BU, BC, Amazon, or Berkeley. We take them in the summer, we move them around, we learn different departments, do a different job. Um, and it's something that we think is very important to, uh, to build the organization. Not only uh, the intern um, get exposed to our company, and hopefully, if they have a positive experience. They'll go back to school and tell all their friends, hey, look, first aid, what a great company. I enjoy there. Uh, uh, I love to work there. But also, at the same time, it, what I found is sometimes the intern are very smart. You know? They're looking at things from a whole different angle. A lot of time, uh, we learn a lot from the intern. <laughs> you believe it or not, you, know? you, you, know, you wouldn't think much about uh, a, uh, a, uh, a sophomore or a junior from college you know, that can teach us. And many times they do. We, 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 n we, we're nicely surprised time after time that many of you in turn can do a better job than a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but I, no, at the end, I, I can't tell you um, how important um, putting the right people in the right job is. It, it's, to me, it's less about the individual. It's more about where we put them. Interesting. David, I, I know that you, you hire some folks and you look for some very, very specific things. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are the behaviors and the attitudes that you know, catch your attention? Um, well, I first of all agree with 
both of you were saying, and I, I honestly try to only hire people who've been interns at Powderfinger um, because uh, you're you're right. Interns can come in and bring completely new things into the office, new perspective, um, teach you things. Um, you know, in our case, someone will like bring in a band that I've never heard of. It's awesome that they found somewhere, and you know, I can't be everywhere at once. And uh, so I like I like hiring interns because you can you can see what they're really like, you can see what they really do. Um, and for me, that's that's my solution. I'd rather have, hire someone who's like, you know, an educated, fresh gun with a passion for music, who uh, fits in and can learn, um, than someone who's been, like, I would never hire someone like me. You know, someone who's been doing it for a bunch of years and already has, uh, you know, an attitude about how it should be done, you know. Um, and uh, because these are the people you're with all the time. You know, you're with these people all day. Like and respect them and believe in them and um, know that they're working hard and doing their job and <coughs> love doing it because it's just you know things are going to go bad otherwise it is a it is a team effort even if we're all doing completely different things and we literally work in a, you know one space like one open room like this so if we're working with a band that's you know doing radio promotion and they're touring you know we can just like yell at each other. Band's number one now, and you're trying to get some CD reviews across the room. That's really going to help you out. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I would I would just agree with, with that notion that it, no matter you can't do everything yourself. You got, and I've been learning myself that you have to really kind of back off and let people do their job. And once you know they can do it, you don't need to be hovering over them all the time. Just check in, make sure you, sure things are going well keep up to date on what you're doing, know what's going on, but don't try to do their job for them. Don't try to micromanage in their face all the time. They're just going to get annoyed with you. And they can't do their job if you're doing that. You can't do your job either. Um, so interns have been very critical for my company. Um, I love having interns in our office. It's just you know fresh perspective. On things, you know, excited about what they're doing. Really glad to have an internship where they're not stapling papers together. Because you know, when people are interns with us, like you're, you're a radio promoter. You're coming in. You're given X number of college radio stations. And you're talking to, you know, the student music director who's also your same age, and you have the same goals that we do. We're trying to get this CD on this chart right now, and you're part of that. And same with publicity. You're calling writers and editors. Some people are responsive and some people aren't. Some people do their job and some people don't. And, you know, it makes you want to wish fire other people's employees. But, but you know, it's like, I don't care if you hate it, but, you know, respond. <laughs> Jeez, you know. Big band, don't be a jerk. So, uh, I, I think that's very, very important, especially if you are a smaller business, I think, you know, because I have to oversee everything. And um, it, is, it is hard to be able to prioritize the things that, that you really need to be doing. I mean, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than like updating our MySpace page every day. You know, I love doing that, but I can't do that. You know, I got other stuff I gotta deal with, you know, so that's off my list. <laughs> so you're, you're very correct. You gotta make sure you know what your job is, keep your priorities, have good people working with you. Let them do their job, check in with them, and um, you know, try to manage it from above. And then, you know, I have my own job too. I'm calling radio stations every day. So I kind of have a couple of three jobs. Really. And Steve, uh, yeah. you, you must really look for some. Yeah, I agree with all that. Addition, I feel quirkiness, offbeat, flirtatious. As far as wait staff and bartenders, I like to keep them coming back. As for them, also accents are good for folks conversation. As far as you know, the wait step. For bookers, I too like to keep it young. You folks have to constantly keep reinventing and have fresh blood. And he's otherwise it'll become passe very quickly. So that's important. But yeah, definitely besides good look doesn't doesn't hurt either. But if it's a good look and attitude, I hate that. But perky and fun, customers come back for it. We all have the same product that I'm doing. It's all about the staff, who's serving, what's the difference. And 
they're really nice to people and they're a little upbeat. People laugh and talk, so it makes a little difference. So we could not okay. have a strong accent, see like that. People laugh. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I know when I'm interviewing somebody too, I try not to look at their resume too closely yeah. before they get there. Because uh, I like to like really kind of grill it while they're sitting in front of me so I can figure out what this means. You know, connect the dots. Sandy, actually, when I interviewed you, looking at your resume, former intern, and um, kind of like a scholarship, she went to school in Canada, and then she was in LA for a summer, and it's like, what the heck is going on here? And just, you know, and it was really cool, like, uh, you know, I have her in front of me was figuring out this picture of who this person was, and so the interview process was like, you know, an hour, and that's, that's not unusual, and that was just for an intern. Again, you have to work with this person every day. <laughs> Would you uh, do the same thing all over again, Joe? Take the same job? Pursue it the same way? Do the same kinds of things, same approach? I, I would, I've had a ball. Uh, I mean, I have to tell you, my career's been a ton of fun. Uh, met a lot of great people, and um, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate to do it all over again. I would probably, I think, it's like anything else, right? When you get to manage your life in hindsight, um, you're a genius. <laughs> you know, every decision I get to do over again, I'm smarter the second time around. Um, actually, that's not fair. Oh, I had made the same mistake more than once. Um, that just proves you're human. So, yeah, yeah quite human. <laughs> oh, no, the list of mistakes is very long. I just try not to duplicate them. I keep inventing fresh ones. That's very, <laughs> very important to do your mistakes fresh, right? Um, because you know, there's just as many, there's an endless supply of them that you can make. Everybody, if you ever think you get to run out of the mistakes, that's not true. There's a mistake factory that continues to invent um, new ones. But I wouldn't. And the key is, as I think, is it's just been about uh, passion, fun, and true to values. You know, you can never let circumstances trump values. You know, anytime somebody challenges or something challenges your values, um, don't ever let them get challenged. I mean, really, no matter what the circumstances. You know, and as you then, if you get the really big companies in your public, that keeps you out of jail. That's it helps. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bernard, would, would you go the same route again, same company, or would you rather be running Microsoft, or are you absolutely happy where you are and doing what you're doing? No, I, I love what I do. And my personal philosophy is, I think I could probably uh, have fun in doing anything I do anyway. And um, I enjoy my first business, and, I'm, and I love my current business. And, you know, and I always say, you know, it's something worth doing. It's something worth doing right. And if you do something right, it's successful, of course you're going to love it. Even if you don't, at the beginning, you're going to learn to love it. That's really how how I feel about, about business. You know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're good at it and you do it well, you start to enjoy it, and after you while, uh, you'll love it. And friendly, when I uh, work with uh, this company, I, I really knew hardly anything about the music industry. Yeah. And coming from, a, coming from a whole different industry, which is more like, uh, home appliance industry in the past. Uh, you go into, start selling, try to make guitar and sell guitar and amplifier. You know, the products are so, so different. But, but I think I know what I, what I know and, then, and I know what I don't know. Um, and I think the business skill uh, for most business is really the same. The skill is, the skill, the requirement is you need to learn the industry, you need to learn what kind of skill you need to acquire in the industry to be successful. Right. So once you understand that and you and you're willing to, to listen to people and and talk to the right people and let people do the right thing, eventually you 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 have a lot of fun. And, and I think one of the one of the things that people a lot of people don't enjoy what they do is because they they, a lot, you know, we have some, a lot of business around, but, but the kind of business they are 
profitable, are growing, right? Had a whole sort of different environment than business. They are struggling, and and you do really don't want to be in a business that's struggling. But even if struggling, no matter how fun a guy you are, you're not gonna enjoy it. Right? So you're talking about laying people off. You're talking about uh, um, um, all the things that human, a normal, normal human being hates to do. Yeah. And you know, and to be honest, with you, I, I done that for, for three months when I, uh, when I sold my first business to Honeywell. We have a lot of duplication in operation. Now, I have a facility in Sao Paulo, one in Tennessee, one in Portugal, one in China, and those already modern facilities. And and Honeywell, a much older company, more established. So when the two pieces combine together, um, it becomes very obvious that a lot of the Honeywell operation need to be shut down. Um, and at that time, I was still the president for a year to help them consolidate all the business. And, and I tell you, that's not fun. You, know, you talk about laying off people, you talk about shutting plants down, and you, and would I want to do that? No, I hate it. That sounds like it was your worst day. <laughs> yeah. That's rough. Yeah. And, and David, would you retrace these steps to end up at Powder Finger Promotions, or would you be a rock star, or <laughs> where would you have ended up? Um, I guess so. I mean, uh, I mean, I, maybe it's counterintuitive to you know Western business sense. I've always kind of had a Zen approach to business, where you know I look for opportunities to come along rather than trying to force them. Um, and then once you see the opportunity, you just gotta grab it, you know? Um, I, mean, I, I, would, I don't think I'd do anything differently, to tell you the truth. I mean, I started off um, with kind of a company set of creatives in my head, you know, I was gonna work anything that I thought uh, sucked or I hated, um, and I was gonna be straight with the people I worked with and try to explain what was going on best I could. And, um, you know, treat people with uh, politeness, you know, some common manners, and listen to them when they talk to you. And um, that makes a big difference. I've been talking to um, Mark Rossi, one of the piano faculty here, about a CD he's making. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm always surprised to hear this kind of thing, but I talked to him for probably hour on Monday on the phone and he was like, boy, you know, I really, I really like you guys because, you know, you don't talk to me like I'm a jerk and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm an idiot and like a lot of people would talk to him that way, you know, and treating the guy with respect because, you know, he deserves it. You know, he's a really great musician and a nice, polite guy, you know, there's no reason not to treat someone that way. Um, I have had to fire a couple of clients <laughs> um, where, because I tend to be pretty protective of my employees, I like the people I work with, and you know, there's been a couple times where someone just got really belligerent, you know, swearing at my publicity staff or something like that, and I'm just like, you know what, here's your money back, and buy it. it's over, you know. And you gotta be willing to do that sometimes, you gotta be willing to say no. You gotta be willing to say no to money sometimes somebody brings you something, you know it, you know it's crap, you know it's going nowhere, and they want to sign a big check, and you say no because you don't like the music, but also because if you send, you know, if I send this out to radio or press, um, my credibility goes down. Because I know it's not good, they're gonna know it's not good, you know, nobody's being fooled here, you know. So you really gotta kind of stick to standards have for yourself and uh, work hard and um, keep organized and uh, you know look for opportunities when they come along and you know one cool thing about having done this for a few years is that I, I now know a lot of people in the music business and um, as many people as there are in the music business um, it's still kind of a small place a lot of people know each other you know you don't go around burning bridges just because you know someone did something kind of wrong to you or whatever, you know? That person might be valuable to you again someday. They may change or you may never need to talk to them again. Um, 
and you just kind of go on and you don't have time to deal with that stuff anyway. Like, okay, this person was a jerk to me. Am I going to spend the next two hours dealing with this person being a jerk to me? Or am I going to spend the next two hours dealing with what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, I don't need to do this. You know, forget him. I'm not going to be mad at him. Goodbye. Onward. So, I don't think I'd do anything different. You know, I'm glad that I didn't get myself in a bunch of debt when I started, you know, borrowing a bunch of money to start. You know, we're, we have no debt. We have some money in the bank, you know. And when I see money in the bank in the Powderfinger account, you know, as the owner, the only thing that goes through my head is, well, we have enough money for X number of pay periods, you know. So if, like, the, the faucet is shut off tomorrow, you know, I can keep everybody here for this long. I can think of it. That's how I think about it money in the bank, not, woo, we can spend all this money on something now. I'm thinking about, you know, I want to, like, cover our butts for a while if we need to, you know. And it's kind of a precarious business, you know, you have customers for six to 12 weeks, and then uh, you don't see them again for a couple years, if ever, you know, <laughs> um, unless they tour a lot. So it's, it's kind of high pressure. It can be pretty intense sometimes, um, but I like that. I like juggling a bunch of balls in the air and talking to a bunch of people and multitasking and trying to do my job and stay out of trouble. Steve, we do it all over. I've been very fortunate. I get to hear incredible music. I get chills from it sometimes. I get to be a lot of interesting people, so absolutely. No change. Uh, I'll be back to music again now. Is that right? Okay. Good. I'm going to uh, come on over to the podium and um, we'll open up for some questions. Discussion and um, these folks are going to give us some time and we have a golden opportunity to, to ask. So let's do that. We've got a question for Mr. McGuire. Um, you mentioned that uh, during a time when Twitter was growing rapidly, one of the problems the company was facing was increasing uh, complacency. How did you begin to see the signs of that? Did your people tell you about it? Did you see something in the numbers that alarmed you? Um, and in what ways did you respond to that? Thank you. <coughs> so I don't know if actually complacency is the word I would choose. One of the ways that Twitter grew was through acquisition. And so what we did is we marched across the country and we bought 15 other companies over a period of uh, six or seven years. And that created some unique challenges. And part of the unique challenges that happen is if you buy uh, a company whose culture is X and your company is Y in terms of culture, that be, creates something that's very difficult because I will tell you that inside of a company only one culture can live. Even if uh, you have a facility that's a thousand miles away, um, as we did, really uh, companies in order to function have to have one culture. And so that is a particular challenge of using acquisition um, as a means to grow. Uh, particularly inside of a retail environment where a particular mission to a customer is a key component of what you're trying to do. And how that manifests itself is in lots of ways. Um, you actually find um, different parts of the country performing in terms of the business very differently. I mean, you know, this is a case where numbers will uh, start to give you a clue as to what's happening, but then you have to ask yourself the question, why? And it's one of those things that's very apparent to me now, looking back on it. I will tell you that at the time for each successive acquisition, when you're in the throes of it, um, to be able to step back and say, gee, we're having a culture issue, wasn't as clear uh, when you're in the middle of it. And it's one of the things that I think came with experience, and as we actually got better at doing acquisitions, we stopped having less trouble. Today, I would tell you that Aside from all the normal filters you go through for an acquisition, does it have cash flow, does it meet your strategic objectives, does it do all those kinds of things, I would tell you that at the end, the very primary filter at the end was just, are the cultures going to fit? Because if they're not, that's really hard to do. Everybody thinks that getting a deal done is all about the legal and the money. You know, the legal and the money is actually pretty easy. So after the lawyers and the bankers go home and you actually have to now operate the thing with people, that, you know, is again, you're down to people, you're down to team, and they need a shared vision and a common goal. And if you haven't done a good job communicating and over-communicating that, particularly at that time when people are nervous and scared, right? Nervous and scared people don't make the best decisions. Another point of advice for many mistakes. Um, 
it's hard to do. But that that piece of people not gelling or you know the culture piece not um, following through to every inch of the company really became a litmus test for success. And I would tell you there were chains we bought who bought the culture lock, stock, and barrel, and they thrived, they took off, they did great. There were chains that we bought whose culture was so different from the companies that um, we would spend tremendous amounts of time and energy and money trying to get that fixed. And you, know, and you would just see it be in fits and starts, they never really landed. So it would just show up in the performance. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Questions from this side. We'll try and alternate, bounce around, and make sure everybody has their uh, opportunity. When you first um, started your business or started getting involved with your work, was there a period of time of no, no success and no profit and just a long period of time that kind of killed your inspiration and how did you, did you face that and how did you get through that? It's a general question to anyone who wants to answer it. Yes, tenacity in my case. Long periods, people know you're there. You just gotta hang in, build your dream. Okay. Anybody add to that? Well, I, I guess it depends depends on the kind of business that you are in, right? For example, if you're in R&D developing pharmaceutical drug, you expect that for a long, long time you're not going to have any revenue. So you, you would be running a huge loss years after year until you have a product that's approved and, and you can sell it. And in between, you, a lot of time you don't really know what someone else is working on. So by the time you get your product done, your product might be obsolete. But that's the kind of risk um, a business decides to take. And, but in my business, it's more consumer product business. Yeah. Um, and for the last 20 something years, uh, my business has been able to be profitable right from the first year. And that's really boiled down to what you know about business and how you control and you, you pick the battle. You, you, know, you develop products that you can develop very, very quickly and profitable. And you start generating revenue and then you take your, your profit and then you continue to invest in your business. And that's the business model I take. But there are people, they would, have a business plan and they, they will say, you know, we plan to lose money for the next five years. Um, and there's a lot of people like that too, and I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, I think those are the decisions you make uh, as an individual, as a business, how you want to build a business. That's really not, in my opinion, that's really not a set model for everyone. You know, I wanted to ask what you were doing post-Tweeter. Um, Marty had inferred that you were involved in a new business, and that you hadn't articulated that yet. Um, so, formed a little company. We named it McGuire Capital. It's the height of uh, ingenuity. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's just making uh, investments, doing some consulting. Uh, since I was the CFO of a public company for so long, um, I'm fairly tied in with the private equity community. And so mostly what I'm doing now, because I've acquired so many companies over my career, is I'm uh, flying around the United States doing valuations for private equity firms and proving to them mathematically that they're paying far too much for the companies they're buying. Um, and uh, that's been great fun um, in a very uh, sadistic sort of way on my part. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that, and it's a company that's just out looking for opportunities uh, in terms of what to invest. So. Uh, between the career of CFO and CEO, it gives me, um, and uh, so one of the examples to take a company very high to where it was getting a 40 multiple in the market, um, to then having to go through and restructure it and you know, lay off 1,500 people and close 80 stores and do things that, while not uh, fun, and I'll echo that, that was, that was not um, what I would call a, um, 
an enjoyable part of the career. I will tell you, however, that it was an unbelievable learning experience that as much as I thought I knew um, about running a business and human nature, that um, having to take a business through that exercise um, was really quite an education. And so, uh, so we'll see what sort of investments uh, we make going forward, but that's, that's, that's what we're doing at the moment. A couple of you have mentioned having a company and then taking it public. I'd like you to mention, it. was there any difference in working in the company after it became public? So, uh, I guess I'll start with that. Um, yes. <laughs> Substantial. First of all, being public is a tax. So there's a trade-off. So once you're public, you... Uh, you have access to capital in a pretty efficient way as long as your company is successful and meeting plans. It is, however, a more expensive way um, to operate your company. So, you know, if you have uh, an auditor come in and audit your company as a private company, it will cost you, you know, let's just say for grins, it's $100,000. Uh, Tweeter's audit fees last year were a uh, million eight. So, um, in addition to being public, you now have a very different rule set in terms of, you know, the compliance community really is working very hard to try to find people's scalps to hang on its wall. And so SEC reviews have gone from being, uh, you know, I say a moderately painful exercise to extremely expensive. The last SEC review that Twitter went through, and keep in mind, Tweeters never had a restatement, never had an issue, and it's had five SEC reviews. The very first SEC review, I did myself, I faxed my answers over to my lawyer, he called me up later that day, and it was okay. We faxed it into the SEC, it was done. I think my bill from the lawyer was $1,000. I think the bill from the accountants was a little more. The last SEC review we had, we had to have a board meeting, two audit committee meetings, three separate attorneys, um, sign off by Deloitte and Touche's national office, and the review cost $225,000 of professional fees to answer 52 questions posed to us by a hired examiner from the SEC who really didn't know much about the retail method of accounting. So that piece of it is pretty frustrating. So there's kind of two points of view with that. You know, I will tell you that having been a public company for a long time, that I see the government, you know, it's a pendulum that really swings. And so as all pendulums swing, you know, they spend very little time in the middle, right? <laughs> they spend more time swinging up or more time swinging down. And so the regulatory environment is a tax, and, and the, the pendulum is the best example I can give you. So. What I advise companies today, and I get asked this question a lot, um, and I'll, I'll hear it particularly from business owners who want to take the company public because they want a liquidity event. You'll have people who've worked 20 years in their business, they've achieved the amount of success, but 90% of their net worth is tied up in their business, and they're maybe in their mid-40s or 50s, and it's feeling like risk, and they want to take some money off the table. and. Um, Having an IPO and going public in America today still has a certain amount of romance attached to it that I think is actually misplaced. There are lots of ways to go about having a liquidity event in your business that doesn't necessarily require an IPO. And I will tell you today that given the regulatory environment and the cost of doing that, that the hurdle for the size company that should be public uh, is probably higher today than it's been in the past. You know, it used to be if you were doing 25 to 30 million bucks and you really had a great idea and we're going to grow, you could take your company public. I would tell you that it would, and it happens still today, particularly in technology, you'll see that more often than not. But in a consumer products company, in a retail company, in a transaction-oriented company, um, I would tell you that that hurdle is going to be a lot higher because you have to be of a, of a large enough size to be able to afford the tax and your back office really needs to be mature enough to be able to deal with the compliance and regulatory requirements that exist as a public company today. They're real and significant and you know Congress has passed special laws that you know they've really made the CEO and the CFO very jail eligible. And as you run larger companies um, you take those things that you have to sign you know, I sign them every quarter very seriously. Because, you know, when you've got 4,000 people in your company and you've got 130 people in your accounting department, 
you, there was a time when the company was smaller when I signed every check and I knew every transaction. I, I, you know, I, I would have been very comfortable when the company was 50 million signing. When the company was 800 million, did I really know that every single transaction had been absolutely accounted for, absolutely perfect, that I had personal knowledge of that? No way. It's impossible, right? 75,000 transactions a month. Uh, you just, you can't. So you're very reliant then on staff, on systems, on series of internal controls to make sure that everything gets disclosed to you. And, um, and so it's a very, very different um, environment. When you just own your own business, honestly, you're accountable to yourself and your employees. When you have outside investors, whether they're private investors because it's a hedge fund or a venture fund or the, or the public at large, you now have a whole other constituency that you're responsible for and responsible to, right? They've given you their money, you're now a steward of their capital, and they're entitled to a return on it. So um, it's just a very different environment to operate it. The business model, whether you're public or private, that things you have to do to satisfy your customers doesn't change at all. The administration piece is a little different. So my personal experience is, you know, I took my company public in 1993. And I think people take the company public for different reasons, and some of the main reasons like raising cash, or at some point after the company became public, uh, some of the shareholders at some point later on want to be able to cash out, sell their stock on a secondary, secondary offering or in the public market. But I think another reason is being a public company certainly will raise the profile of the company on its own. Mm, and, and I'm not sure those were the reasons I took my company public, to be honest with you. I took it public because I, was, I thought it was fun. <laughs> yeah. And not a very good reason, but, uh, but sometimes, you know, you, as I said, you follow your heart. Yeah. And <coughs> but that was in 1993. The, uh, the financing and the capital markets since then have changed quite a lot. Um, and and if, you, if you're a reasonable businessman today, you look at uh, the capital market. And I think for most business, uh, you concluded that if you're less than a billion dollars, then you shouldn't be going properly. But there's so m much package that comes with being a public company. It's really not worthwhile. First of all, on a, uh, on a valuation standpoint, I think nowadays, uh, apple for apple, so you can sell uh, your business to an equity firm for a lot more money than you can sell your stock in the public market. So for that reason alone, I don't know why anybody would want to go public. But um, it makes sense for a lot of companies, for companies that are much larger in size, companies in certain industries that the, uh, the uh, the market still put a very high variation on those companies. Um, and I think the way a public company is run is very different from a private company. And in a, and particularly so in a smaller company, um, like unless you're General Electric, you, know, you have so many divisions and department to that you can combine, report your earnings, you can, one department, one business doesn't do well, something else is doing a bit better, so you can, you, you, at the end you always do okay, but in a smaller business, um, with all the report you to do, you can't really hide anything. Um, and that's why sh uh, most of the company are really, very really short term driven. Uh, so the, the CEO and the CFO are more worried about what they're gonna report next quarter. Uh, and I don't really have any time to think about what they're gonna do for the business two years from now. Um, and I think it's a huge, huge uh, compromise. Yeah. Um, and timing is another, is another issue. Unless you're a huge company, or if you're a few hundred million dollar business in manufacturing, or you're a few billion dollars in retail, you're still a very small company. Um, and 
and, and, and there's only a few people in the organization that does a lot of work. And in the public market, it demands a lot of attention from the CEO, from the CFO, um, to, to run the business. But on top of that, uh, uh, the, the money manager, the investor, always want meetings and meetings after meetings. They want one-on-one, uh, -on -one, they want this and want that. Um, how do you spend your time between running your business and uh, communicate with your investor? I think it's a huge challenge. And I personally, I have flown uh, to four cities in one day. Uh, and I don't know how I'm doing nowadays, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's what you have to do uh, 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 as, a, as a business. Um, so in, in a general sense, I don't think we should be talking about uh, running a public company in this room. But uh, um, I think always the first thing is to build a business big enough and then you worry about that. And, and, and I think it's a long way to go um, um, to, uh, to take any company, any new company perfect, particularly in the music industry. And my question is for Mr. Chu. Uh, I know the first act has done some very uh, creative and unorthodox things with, uh, with sales strategies and, and marketing, whether it was offering instruments at a very accessible price point or marketing campaigns like giving guitars away with Volkswagens. Were you met with criticism with, uh, when you presented these sort of ideas? And if so, kind of what allowed you to work past that, and push forward, and, and continue with those? You know, um, I want to think that we have a very uh, noble mission in our business. Our business is really try to put more guitars and instruments in more people's hands. Um, and I think we are the, really the only company that we serve uh, a very unique segment of the market where a lot of our products are distributed to the big box retailer like uh, Toys R Us, uh, Target, Walmart, BJ, and people like that. And sure, we got a lot of grief from the music store. And they, they think that they think we we compete with them, um, but no, we really don't. Let me tell you why. Uh, although with every with most of our adult instrument, people buy the first one, and that's the guitar they can play for their life. It's not like it's, it's not like it's a beginner product. It, it's a very high quality. It's a guitar people can grow with. But what we're very proud of is really we. Uh, bring a lot more people you know, to play guitar, to play flute, to play drum. Otherwise, most of these people would not have played. You know. Our whole idea is you know, we don't believe that as parents, you know, they're going to make a plan, you know, five years from now, uh, when Joe is 12 years old, I'm going to go to a music store to buy him a guitar or a drum. People don't do that. People, people buy uh, stuff, most people, most people buy it in pouch purchase. Uh, and our idea is we want to put our instruments in where people shop every day. Yeah, and, and I think that business model has been very successful. You know, and the campaign you talk about, you know, we, you know, we formed an alliance and marketing campaign with Volkswagen last year and where we get slash and John Mayer and other celebrity to promote, uh, almost like you buy a Volkswagen, you get a guitar. And some people will say that, you know, 10 years from now, you know, the guitar is still great, the car is gone. <laughs> yeah, right. but, uh, but we use that, you know, really more to, uh, to promote our plan, to get more people interested in music. Um, uh, and I can't tell you how much I believe, you know, if everyone pick up the guitar, there will be no war. <laughs> I personally thought it was a very cool TV commercial, by the way. I didn't buy the car. <laughs> uh, more questions? Steven? Yes. Right? Okay. Um, so you briefly mentioned that um, I, well, first of all, I, I've been to the cutting room a few times. It's great. I really liked it. Um, 
And you briefly mentioned that you guys want to move out and get a bigger place. That's really cool. And also that eventually you could expand, like like you said, open up a place in Las Vegas. And, right. um, so I guess kind of a two-part question. Um, is that something that you want to do uh, in the near future? Yes. And also, um, what... Okay. <laughs> you know, Sandy wants right. the space. <laughs> yeah. Um, at what point did you realize that, wow, like, our business is doing so great and, um, like, that you could actually, that you could actually do that? Because, I mean, that's like, that's like a huge project for you. For you to do. It was kind of a long, long-term plan, kind of from the beginning. Um, it's, it's all branding today, you know. It's, um, we don't own the building. We pour out the liquor and the staff comes and goes. So everything's in the name. In New York, the overhead is getting so crazy, it's almost impossible to make real money there. The, like the Virgin Records store is the largest volume store, but they don't make any money, but it's that sign in TV in Times Square. So you establish the name in New York and then make money in other cities. It's probably can't make real big money anymore. The rents are just ridiculous. Everything is ridiculous. So that's, um, that's the reason for it. And you know, you've got to grow. So New York's just changing. It's gotten very corporate. It's all Starbucks and banks, and it's just not single use. It used to be so many live music venues have gone. It's really sad. Right. And are you? Um, is it just you? You and another person owns Kennedy? Right. And Chris Nowick, he's Mr. Big Deal. He's my partner. Right. And just that you, you actually own the business. Yeah. He's on the small piece. But um, also, we're, there's a lot of like a live nation owns big space, spaces, a thousand people, two thousand, three thousand, seven fifty. And then there's a lot of hundreds, nothing that in between 253. And that's the market I want to get. Because there's an 8 o'clock dinner theater, which we do John Rivers Gym, we have people like that with his tablecloths. They do bottles of wine, steak, salmon. There's, and then the younger people come out later. There's a market for that. And there's bands that I can't get because we can't seat enough people. So we're too big to be a small room and too small to be a big room. So there's that in between that I want to hit. And that's why I want a bigger space in New York. And the area's changed. It's become hip hop central. The place next door, they get petted out for guns and knives on the way in on the weekends. Airport. It's really hurt our business. The whole oh. street is like insane. The area's changed. It's another reason we have to move. What's the address? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really just the night scene has gotten really bad. Really? So, what area are you? That's Flatiron. And it's so many, it's just, they go in the bars and it's gotten so bad. And the shootings in the night, it's, it's just kills late night weekends. It blocks two up for drive by shootings. So, it's just the neighborhood's changed. So, it's just, I want to get to Hell's Kitchen, the old theater, and it still feels like Okay. She does want the space. <laughs> I'm just curious. You mentioned your rent had tripled. Yeah. Now, if you're forced to stay where you are, when, when would be the next incremental jump, or are you just better off moving into a different well, this, neighborhood? The space I'm looking at is two thousand dollars a month more for twice the square footage. Really? Right in the building, and really want What part of town is that? That's Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. so the music studios are there. We'll the TV right. studios, the Lincoln Center, the theaters. It's a hundred-car parking garage in the building. It's on that. So it's much better. I had a really bad man. New York is famous for that, too. He has like 20 buildings, all mortgages paid. Inherited them. He just likes to torture people. <laughs> nice. I, mean, I know it doesn't make any sense, but he's famous for that. And he's just, you know, it's, I know none of this. There's one of those in every city, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's just, you know, it's his thrill. He doesn't need the money. He's a billionaire. He just likes to torture people. Well, only use the freight elevators, things like that. There's a scaffold up for three and a half years of no construction. It's a nice or It's just, it, you know, rats running on across the street. It's just a fancy. <laughs> no extra charge. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of intuition involved in the business. And my question to you was, um, it's open to any gentleman, but um, has there been a time where your gut instincts have been different from like the logistics of the business? When have those times been? How do you deal? How do you manage? I would say yes to that. Um, we promote a lot of jam bands, and the first band we promoted was String Cheese Incident. Um, their album Round the Wheel, and I, I got to tell you, at this time, uh, College Radio, CMJ, everybody in the music business hated jam bands. <coughs> And we decided that, um, that uh, well, I decided that we were going to start promoting them and look for jam band specialty shows. And it was totally just a gut feeling. You know, there were a couple of bands, like I was never into some of the um, 
bigger jam bands. And so these couple bands started coming along that I thought were a little more interesting, like the String Cheese Incident, where they're really smart and they're figuring out how to make a studio album as a jam band and the tracks not be nine minutes long and things like that. Um, most bands that kind of fall into that niche had not figured that out. So it was death at radio to send these CDs out. You know, they were known for being long, kind of wanky tracks where you know, a lot of kind of self-indulgent soloing and group soloing and on and on. And we just kind of picked a couple of key projects and started tracking down stations and discovered that uh, David Gans, who was tied with the Grateful Dead, had a couple shows going on the radio and some people like that out there. And so we started sending out new music to these people who were mainly just playing the Grateful Dead. And um, <clears throat> there was, uh, you know, I, I, I would say like String Cheese Incident kind of set the bar really high in terms of business model. Um, they do everything. And, um, you know, when you go to their website, you can not only find out about the band and where they're playing, you can buy concert tickets, you can buy transportation to the concert, everything they control from top to bottom. And they do it their way and they do it themselves. And, you know, us bringing them to radio and a couple of other bands that were just like really smart and understood that they needed to change in order to get radio airplay press made just uh, a, a huge difference and um, it was us there's nobody else there who even liked these bands or saw anything valuable and we've just kind of evolved with with it we've stuck with it and um, it's just been an awesome thing and now we're in a situation where you know we can take on something like Modesky Martin Wood and we don't just send it to jazz stations or college stations we send it to the jam band stations because they've changed a lot too now so it's been awesome, you know, now they're playing a lot of jazz. They're even playing country sometimes, you know. So that that was just totally throwing caution to the wind and doing something where I, where you know everybody was telling me it was awful music and nobody wanted to play it and um, just really kind of growing with it. It was, it was really an awesome experience. I'd say a big part of uh, my company uh, has been built on that. My question is for, is for Steve um, from the cutting room. Um, checking out y'all's website, I was kind of impressed with the uh, broad scope of uh, what you guys are trying to do. Um, and I was curious to know, uh, has that always been part of your, part of the plan? Um, for example, you know, when you started the club, did you expect that you were going to be doing a sort of dinner theater sort of things and also movie, you know, screenings and and so forth, or has it sort of expanded? Um, and what's been your experience um, in terms of making very diverse things profitable in one location? Yeah, yeah as long as it's good, that was the key, we'll do it. And, and it's hard to be do any one thing, not, not any one thing is really strong enough anymore. So that's certainly, and then your crowd does kind of lead to the dinner thing, we didn't expect, that just kind of works at 8 o'clock when anybody's going out, so it works really well. But generally, there's always a broad spectrum of stuff at the beginning. As a musician, it's good, you know, who cares what genre falls in, it's good. And, and it's fun to break up with some comedy, or our last couple Saturday nights when people aren't into serious listening or something. So yeah, it was always, always the thing, it's entertainment. I grew up in, like, in, with Ed Sullivan show and all that, whereas variety shows, it's kind of like that, you know. So that's what You ever play in your own club? Yeah, I have, because I've dealt with some great people. So. Really? Yeah. We have a Monday night jam, if you guys ever in on a Monday. It's a lot of good players show up. For that. It's excellent. I'm just wondering um, what advice you'd have to someone who is starting up a, a venue restaurant, such as the Cutting Room, and uh, what obstacles were you confronted um, with that process, and how did you overcome them? Start with a lot of capital. We did it with smoke and mirrors and credit cards. And there's so much stuff that is going to come up that you couldn't even imagine. So make sure you have capital. It's so hard without it. You get a good lawyer to read all the fine print and all the leases and all that. I didn't sign this lease. I inherited it, like I said earlier. But it was a really bad lease, a bad, a bad landlord. Get a good location where the community board's not going to drive you crazy. There's no schools or, or um, churches or any of that kind of thing. You don't have any problems with neighbors above. But definitely a lease, the good lawyer, and a lot of capital. That'll save them a lot of just find a niche, you know, just fall in love with a million bottle service lounges with DJs, you know. 
have a question, Joe. Uh, when you, when Queer sponsored Great Woods, mm -hmm. uh, what were you looking to accomplish, and how did you measure your success? Uh, measure the success of Great Woods. Mm -hmm. So here's what I would tell you: the the deal that we did here. Um, wasn't as translated in other venues. When we did the deal here, Twitter was advertising probably um, 300 to 350 gross rating points a week on radio. And so that's how you measure how much advertising you buy. And that probably cost us uh, between May and September of the season, um, cost us about $800,000. By just in the Boston radio market. The deal that we did with Great Woods, we signed a, an 11 year, $8 million deal uh, to call up Tweeter Center, which lo and behold was about the $800,000. The difference was is that for that same amount of money, because everybody would then say the Tweeter Center, the trade off was is A, we've always wanted to have an affinity with music. You know, we have lots of musicians that work at the company, you know, it's founded as an audio company. Um, and so it was a very natural tie-in. You know, why 3M bought Candlestick Park, I still don't, I still don't know. But Tweeter, you know, hooking up with an outdoor performance venue, you know, actually made sense to us in terms of it fit with the company. And the math was able to work because theoretically, and you know, I still don't know if this was actually a play by the marketing guy to get good seats and free tickets, or if it was really a smart uh, marketing move. I think we got, I think he got both. Um, the math worked that we actually got more impressions uh, during that period of time than what we were spending on the straight radio, and we augmented it with radio. It didn't show up much in year one, but in year two, all of a sudden, the Boston market was doing about 20% comp store sales, whereas the rest of the markets of the country were doing seven and eight. And really, the only thing that was different was the music sponsorship, so there became a much greater name recognition. So we thought that that theory worked out great, and then we started to actually take it to other markets. But what was interesting, it did well in Philadelphia as well, where the brand was pretty well known. Um, in Atlanta, in Chicago, and in Southeast Florida, though, it really did not have the same effect. And so the learning there was is that it worked here and it worked in Philly because the brand was already known, and it was really augmenting a brand that was already known among the enthusiasts as a mechanism to get a brand that wasn't that well known and then get it to be well known, that really didn't work. And so, you know, I don't know what the magic number is, but when you do measurements of unaided recognition of a brand name, and, you know, when you hire marketing companies, you can go into a market and do you know, these surveys to try to understand where does your brand fit and sit. There is a place where the music sponsorship would work, but if the brand recognition was below a certain level, it really ended up being a waste of money. And so, um, you know, you talk about making mistakes, it's a lesson we learned the hard way, and those, talk about a good lawyer, you know, those contracts were, you know, 10 years long uh, for those. So in the ones where you did a bad one, you know, that was tough. But the, the one here was, uh, was terrific, and it became, aside from things with the customers and the knowledge, um, it was a great perk for employees, because we would have 100 tickets to every show, and we, you know, we put them on a website and we let employees um, bid for them either based on, you know, uh, contest points or seniority. And then if you got great seats to a concert, you know, you couldn't go to the next five so that everybody got a, a, a chance. And that was just a really terrific thing that the employees locally here uh, in New England uh, just loved, uh, you know, as a benefit. So it really worked out pretty well, though I, I, I will tell you that the first time the director of marketing came into me with this, you know, Eight and a half million dollar marketing spend, and at that time I think Twitter was two hundred fifty million in revenue. I think I might have bodily thrown them out of my office. So, <laughs> uh, but it did work out. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, we're going to wind it down. I'd, I'd like to ask each of you to maybe compress everything that everybody needs to know into about two minutes, <laughs> <laughs> if, that, if that's possible. <laughs> Marry well. <laughs> Amen. By the way, that has nothing to do with money. That has everything to do with a partner who shares your values and you can go through life with together because, you know, you'll have times in your life that you do well and you'll have times in your life that you do poorly. But the relationships 
whether they're with your spouse or with your children, um, those endure beyond all of the business stuff. So, you know, you started at one point with a work-life balance uh, question, and I guess I would end with that, is that at the end of the day, whether you're successful or not, and, you know, that's going to be have as much to do with how you measure success as with how much money you make, and you shouldn't really confuse the two because they're not always related. Um, at the end of the day, it's the relationships in your life that will really matter. Good advice. Bernard, do you have a little bit uh, you can instill wisdom-wise? Sure. Well, first, I'd like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight to talk to you. Um, but I, I would say that um, you know, you're all very young, and whatever you want to do, just follow your heart. You know, you're young, and you're going to make some mistake. Um, but if you don't really make mistakes, then you don't really do a lot of things. So do whatever you feel you like to do. Um, at the, I think at the end, everything else will be OK. Um, um, at least that's how I, how I did. I follow my heart. Um, uh, um, um, I was not afraid of doing something new. I wasn't afraid of doing something that somebody else, somebody else hasn't done. As a matter of fact, you know, innovation is always a key to most companies' success. I mean, when we talk about innovation, you know, we are not just talking about product. I mean, innovation in concept, in operation, in your thinking, in what you do, and in what you don't do. These are all part of that. Um, and I always try in my, in, in my career, I always try to do a lot better in the industry. And that's my innovation. I, I don't like to be compared uh, to people in the industry. And you know, a lot of time when, when I have uh, people who are new to the business, um, one of the things I always say is, you know, yeah, this is good for, for company X, and it should be good for us. And I hate listening to that. And, and I like to set my own standard and, and set a very high standard, and then we, we work from there. And I think if, if you do that, you don't find a lot of success. And good luck to you all. Thank you. Wise words. David? Uh, I follow my gut a lot. Um, I gotta say, uh, I think intuition is important. Just like keeping your ear to the ground, you know, get out there and meet people. And um, you know, I, I think you have to have a lot of uh, passion for what you're doing. You really have to because it's just it's it's difficult. You know, you're, you're doing hard work, and it's not just you know if, if you fail in your business. Um, you know, it's different than when you're in school. You're on your own. But you got to take chances, and um, I've made mistakes, but I've also, you know, made some decisions that were seemed kind of counterintuitive to other people. Um, you know, we decided to embrace the jazz radio format a couple of years ago <clears throat> when everybody else was complaining that it was kind of dying out, and um, that seemed like another kind of dumb decision to a lot of people. And um, but I wasn't looking at that. I wasn't looking at who's listening to jazz radio. I was looking at, you know, what are people going to see? You know, what are people listening to? What do they what do they want? You know? And part of the answer there was um, something like jazz, you know. And um, <clears throat> so my feeling was, you know what, this format, the people in it aren't getting any younger. People who are listening to it aren't getting any younger. I just want to challenge them. Let's like get some really good stuff that, you know, like Modesty Martin Wood or whatever that we know young people are listening to and like, and just kind of like try to shove it down their throats a little bit. You know, it's like tell them why this is great. Tell them why they should be playing this. Okay, it's not monk, you know, but your listeners want to hear this. You know, when you tell somebody that, then you can really kind of back that up. You know, like here there was a show about a year ago, where it was uh, Christian McBride, DJ Logic, and Bobby Previtt, and Charlie Hunter Trio. It was packed. It was sold out. And I was like, one of the only guys there over 30. You know? I thought, man, this is just awesome. You know? it's, 
it's happening. I don't care what's happening on the radio. You know, forget that. Look at these people here. And so we just, you know, I just kind of decided I was going to send them these CDs anyway. And it's been just, it's been a huge success. So sometimes you got to do things that even seem like they, you know, might be counterintuitive because you're, you're feeling it. Like this is going to work. There's an audience for this somewhere and, you know, damn it, I'm going to be the one to make it work. And um, then you just go for it. And, uh, you know, you're throwing the dice. But if you believe in it and um, it's not going to kill you, if you fail a little bit, then I, I say go for it. You know, just keep organized, keep your head up, keep your ducks in a row, as Marty likes to say to me often. Um, and you're going to be okay even if you uh, do make a mistake, even if you do have a failing. Steve, your words of advice are... Uh, I agree with Art. Follow your heart and you can't fail. Be nice to people and be quality on every level. Nice mantra. Nice mantra. Well, uh, any last minute questions that we caught everybody? Well, you know, these events are not easy to pull together, and I can't do it all by myself. And I, I just want to say thanks to our new dean, Dava Hamley. She pitched in and helped out. And Don has supported us as always, and John Kellogg. And the faculty were here tonight, the students, very, very appreciative. Ms. Kim, thank you. Uh, these people have given their todays for your tomorrow. And I, I, th I think you had a golden opportunity to, to watch some masters, some rock stars of the business world here. Uh, it's an opportunity we don't get to you know, present too, too often. Um, their advice is sound. I mean, I can preach this until I'm blue in the face, but you, you, know, you can only believe me a little bit. You bring people in like this, it's like, wow, yeah, that's cool stuff. Um, just remember these things. So Joe, thank you. Bernard, thank you. thank you. David, thank you. Uh, Steve Walter, thank you. Karen Bell, thank you for helping uh, from the Office of Alumni Affairs. Uh, so, um, last minute questions from the bashful, the shy. <laughs> All right. Thank you.